and namely session 1 was skilling for ship building orienting india's maritime education to meet the shipyard industry's demand for 21st century in which chairman was lieutenant general dv shikarkar who is decorated with pvsm avsm bsm and the speaker for this session was shrimati malini shankar retired ias who is now vc that is vice chancellor in indian maritime university our second session consisted of historical legacy of ship building in india as a compass to chart the way ahead where the chairman was dr anada angana guha roy research associate in delhi policy group and speaker was kamaru johnson odakkal retired and former director of maritime history society our third session was atmanirbhar in ship building in relation to maritime vision 2030 where our chairman was vice admiral shekhar sinha who is decorated with pvsm avsm nm bar adc and speaker was anthony prince president of sets gtrs nausea bahamas so now let's begin with our fourth session of the day i request assistant professor vinod sonone to please give introduction and welcome to the chairman and honorable speaker yes thank you sneha ma'am good afternoon to everyone present here i am extremely overwhelmed to get this opportunity to welcome you all you all have assembled here today to motivate and cherish the young minds present among us apart from this it gives me immense pleasure to welcome our chairman of this session dipak shetty sir irs retired former secretary to the government of india and dg of shipping and our speaker of this session commander jay kumar retired former naval constructor and specialist in ship design they are working towards connecting young minds to strive towards success and achievement we are grateful to them for accepting our invitation and becoming a part of this session the sub theme of today's session is leveraging defense ship building to catalyze india's ship building industry but before we start with our lecture on this sub theme i would like to introduce the chairman of this session profile of mr dipak shetty irs retired He is a direct recruit member of the 1980 batch of the Indian Revenue Service Customs and Central Excise. He had served in the Indian Civil Service for 36 years and eventually retired in the highest rank of Secretary to the Government of India. He was the Director General of Shipping, Ministry of Shipping, Government of India for two years in 2015 to 2016. Immediately prior to that, he was assigned as Joint Director General of Shipping, second in commanding officer. for four years cumulating to six consecutive years of posting in the director general of shipping indian maritime and flag administration he has had numerous and varied postings in his career in his finance department he started as an assistant commissioner eventually rising to the grade of principal chief commissioner of customs central excise and service tax further he was earlier additional textile commissioner ministry of textiles government of india for five years he is the recipient of 25 national and international awards commendations including the presidential award of appreciation certificate for specially distinguished record of service bestowed on the republic day 2002 commendation certificate for meritorious and sincere services rendered conferred on the international customs day 2002 commendations separately from the external affairs minister government of india in 2015 and foreign and maritime affairs minister government of seychelles in 2016 for his outstanding services at the global maritime stage commendation from the contact group on piracy off the coast of somalia at the united nations new york in 2014 for his singularly excellent contribution to the best in class international model of rescue relief and rehabilitation of piracy impacted indian seafarers commendation from the director interpol for his successful organization of, of debriefs of piracy affected indian seafarers and contribution to international evidence collection against somali pirates commendations from the ministry of finance government of india between 1986 to 1991 for his consistently exceptional anti smuggling performance he is widely acknowledged as having been primarily instrumental through his proactive and relentless pursuit in various global fora from 2012 to 2015 in revolving the high risk area in the western indian ocean region as sought by india in 2015 this has led to an average annual savings to indian exim consumers of about 
rupees 800 to 4,000 crore of additional warrant premium on seaborne trade. They continue to be empaneled on the global roster of experts of the Security Council of the United Nations for maritime transportation and maritime crime. He is a specialist in global anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing standards and strategies, having been trained in these areas by the Asia Pacific Group on money laundering, financial action task force, World Bank, and international money as was part of their projects in Nepal and Australia. I request Nailman for the next procedure. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your very gracious and kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Deepak Shetty, and I'm very, very delighted, honored, and privileged to be here amidst all of you this afternoon to chair this session. I believe that uh, the theme chosen is extremely topical, contemporaneously relevant, um, and I'm deeply thankful to all the organizers for this very kind invite extended to me. Uh, amidst all of you. Uh, I would also like to extend a warm and cordial welcome to my fellow panelists and speaker of the session, uh, Commander Jay Kumar. Um, I, in the five minutes that I have before me, um, in terms of a broad layout of the introduction, let me just uh, sort of make a few preliminary remarks. The 21st century stands recognized as the century of the seas and the oceans. Um, this was um, documented in a doctrine of the Indian Navy uh, dating back to the year 2015. Now, it's a cliche to say that the primacy of the seas is duly recognized uh, in terms of some of the critical parameters. Let's just sort of run through this very quickly. One is that the global seabone trade uh, constitutes about 70% by volume at about uh, by value and roughly about 95% by volume. Uh, the second aspect which is now coming into play um, in terms of criticality is the blue economy paradigm. Then you have the, the role of the Navy duly supplemented by the merchant Navy. And uh, I'm firmly of the view that the sinews or the robustness of any economy which is aspiring to be a global power well beyond the regional uh, outreach that it bids fair to have is primarily pivoted in terms of uh, uh, the maritime prowess it has. Um, needless to say that uh, the uh, present times are uh, characterized by the exponential growth in research and development, science and technology, and cutting edge innovations, uh, which are widely recognized, including in the field of shipbuilding industry, et cetera. Now, to very swiftly touch upon uh, and skim through some of the elements which I do believe will have a bearing and sort of uh, impact on how we look at shipbuilding going forward, including leveraging the defense paradigm. Uh, you know, given these supply chain disruptions, which we've all been privy to, in particular in the last two years of the pandemic, um, that assumes a salient uh, importance. Then we are also bidding fair to become a $5 trillion economy and even beyond. Uh, we have the Sagar Mala, which is kicked in sometime in 2015. It is uh, sort of gradually coming into the fore. Then you have the Atma Nirvan uh, Abhiyan campaign. There have been fiscal uh, uh, benefits that have been extended to the shipbuilding industry. And I distinctly recall that you have the element of subsidy, which stands uh, provided. Uh, that had a sunset clause way back in 2014, but subsequently in the year... Uh, 2015 December that has been now brought into play again. Uh, then you have the provision of the right of first refusal in terms of the licensing, which is extended by the Director General of Shipping for ships which are built within the country indigenously. And then, of course, I do believe a time has come where we need to look at uh, also a production linked incentive scheme framework for the shipbuilding industry. Uh, with these preliminary remarks, before I get on to, uh, you know, sort of uh, expanding a little bit towards the end of my presentation, I would like to now uh, sort of invite uh, uh, Com uh, Commander Jay Kumar. But before I do that, I have the, uh, the pleasure and the honor of sort of giving his introduction. Uh, may I, with your indulgence, read this out. Uh, Commander Jay Kumar holds a graduate degree in naval architecture and shipbuilding 
from the Cochin University of uh, Science and Technology. He is also an alumnus of the Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, and the Defense Institute of Advanced Technology, where he completed his postgraduate master's program in applied mechanics, that is naval construction, and mathematical modeling and computer simulation, respectively. He is a product of the Indian Navy's uh, premier naval engineering course and has served in the Naval Constructor Branch, which is the technical sword arm of the Indian Navy, for well over 20 years. Um, in his career in the Navy, he has served with distinction in the Navy's Directorate of Naval Design, Warship Overseeing Team, as well as the Naval Dockyards. In these appointments, he was instrumental in driving several coveted naval shipbuilding projects uh, through various stages of acquisition, uh, straddling design, costing and contract negotiations, project sanctions, construction, trials, and delivery. He has played a key role in adopting data-driven approaches to several aspects of warship design, construction, and acquisition. In his second avatar, post his um, exit from the Indian Navy, he has joined the KPMG as a principal consultant and the subject matter expert in KPMG's aerospace and defense advisory practice. He presently leads several MAPI engagements for evolving strategies for entry, diversification, and growth for the defense manufacturing businesses, both in the private as well as the public spaces, and is a key part of KPMG's data-driven approach to business strategy evolution in the A&D sector. Uh, with this, uh, may I now request uh, Commander Jay Kumar to please hold forth for the next 20 to 25 minutes. Commander Jay Kumar, please go for it. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your kind introduction. Uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Cambrian uh, Captain uh, Naravne for giving me this opportunity to uh, deliver this lecture. Uh, I see a lot of my esteemed colleagues and seniors from the Navy are also present. So it, it is a, some sort of a homecoming for me, even though, uh, like they say, you, you can take a person out of the Navy, but you can never take the Navy out of the person. So that continues. Uh, so I, uh, I have tried. This is uh, the, the lecture or the presentation that I'm planning to deliver today. Uh, let me just share the screen. I hope my screen is visible to everyone. Hello. Not as yet, uh, Commander. Yeah. Just a minute. I think there is some issue sharing. Just one minute, please. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is it visible now? Yes, indeed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, uh, I, this uh, this was a, a piece of work or a kind of a research study that we did uh, as KPMG last year in 2020. But it was largely drawn from my experience of about 15 years in the naval ship design and shipbuilding and my interactions with several stakeholders in the industry. Uh, so, I was able to see the perspective from a user side. I've been able to interact uh, with a large number of stakeholders from the delivery. So uh, they, I thought that we thought that we will collectively put this together. And in the morning session, I noticed that there were a lot of people talking about while there was a vision, somehow it did not uh, transform into actual fruit, bear, actual bearing fruit in the ground. Uh, for a lot of reasons. So we, we also try to analyze where we could do better or what we could specifically do in this regard. Before I go, I'll just quickly tell you about KPMG. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, it's a, it's a, it's a global international network of consulting firms. Uh, we have about, uh, in India at least, we have more than 25,000 people working. We have 2,700 clients spread out about uh, in 13 cities. Uh, we have a huge presence in the uh, government and uh, healthcare system uh, advisory services sector, uh, specifically in the aerospace and defense practice in which I am a principal consultant and a subject manager expert. Uh, we cover the entire gamut of uh, the major stakeholders, well out of the 16 DPSUs, 
we are involved with both the defense industrial corridors which are being set up in uh, tamil nadu in uh, and in uh, up we work uh, extensively with the state governments we also work with a large number of domestic and global oems and a significant number of uh, players in the public and private sector in the aerospace and defense manufacturing uh, we work across functional areas of strategy formulation business planning and operational transformation etc just to give you a brief overview of what kpmg does and uh, we have uh, as a team we have been uh, preliminarily focused in bringing value added services to the defense sector because we realized that you know indigenous manufacturing uh, there is a current drive that has been embraced by the nation as a whole and uh, there are lots of us who are bringing in different kinds of expertise and with the right kind of guidance and the right kind of we can tap the right kind of potential that is available in the industry and guide them towards uh, diversification and growth and and therefore contribute largely to the national uh, goal of achieving self reliance in defense manufacturing with this uh, brief background i will just come to what we were uh, talking about what i was talking about in terms of a strong ship building industry now uh, uh, while i would uh, would have loved to give a lecture on my days in the naval in the directorate of naval design largely focusing on how design has evolved and what are the great things that we are doing uh, thanks to my exposure to the industry from the consulting point of view uh, we have been able to try and appreciate a large part of the economic angle of uh, of any industry and uh, what are the what are the direct and indirect benefits that one is likely to accrue and so as part of the study we try we, we did uh, there were some earlier studies which were done by kpmg so relying on that and some subsequent studies we were able to try and understand how beneficial a strong shipbuilding industry is so with that perspective you know one of the greatest things about shipbuilding is compared to any other industry it is one of the best employment it has one of the best employment generation potential uh, so uh, in addition to directly giving employment to a large number of skilled labor there is a significant amount of employment it generates at the tier 1 and tier 2 and tier 3 supplier level uh, and if you compare it to any other industry say heavy industry or automotive or uh, civil construction shipbuilding has a relative employment per unit turnover as, as one of the highest it's eight compared to one in the it eight times what you get in the auto or commercial industry so uh, so therefore shipbuilding has an extraordinary potential in terms of employment generation which going forward as a nation with a large number of young people coming into the fray is going to be a uh, it can be an extremely beneficial path that we can take if you view it from the long term benefits that the industry can give us uh, another important thing about ship building is the fact that it's a, it's an excellent investment multiplier i will come to the fact that kind of triggers uh, the uh, growth in the ancillary industries and what is the significant value addition that comes from the ancillary industry but if you look at uh, ship building as a whole for every unit uh, you know investment in ship building it generates nearly 10 times the investment in the related ancillary industry comp comprising of tier 1 tier 2 and tier 3 suppliers so so any investment in ship building is going to have uh, a cascading positive effect on the subs on the other related industries which are uh, uh, which are related to ship building so with all these great things it's not something that we have discovered this is something our forefathers also knew which is the reason why uh, there was a lot of focus on you know trying to indigenize the building as much as possible so there were lots of efforts that were made over uh, different periods of time to figure out how best can we leverage this industry which has got so much potential so, uh, so there were there were uh, periods of big boom and then there were periods of lull and there was a huge uh, boom that happened around 2003 but then kind of died down by 2008 9 10 and uh, uh there were lots of attempts to try and invigorate it lots of investment went in lots of infrastructure was set up but uh, but for some reason it did not really kind of bear the fruits that it, it people originally thought that it would there are several reasons for it and if you look at the current state if you look at the current state like i said you know there was a lot of incentives that have been done to address the supply side but uh, there has not been too much done to address the demand side of things uh, uh, largely for several reasons you know you, there are many reasons for this but if you look at it the current state of the industry is there is a reasonably high demand and over, and consequently an over dependence on naval ship building most of the orders most of the shipyards are currently engaged largely in naval ship building projects the dpsu and the psu shipyards which have traditionally hold uh, held strength in this area they have developed a very good amount of capability thanks to the navy's sustained uh, you know interest in uh, you know unlike the other two services we take pride in the fact that we embraced indigenization 50 60 years ago and uh, we we put faith in the dpsu shipyards and they have grown along with us they have developed a large amount of capability 
they've got very good experience of course they do get a lot of government support and they have a certain amount of financial stability and consequently they have no lower working capital costs etc but they also have gaps they have a limited infrastructure capacity they are not in a position to expand so if the load goes up they struggle they have to depend on you know other people to deliver for them and many times this leads to cost and time overruns in projects and if you look at the overall efficiency and productivity of the shipyards they definitely there is a little bit of a bridge to cross before we get to the kind of international standards that have been set by other shipyards and if you look at the private industry like with a lot of hope a lot of investment in infrastructure was uh, taken up say particularly in the mid 2000s onwards where several sh uh, shipyards with very good infrastructure came up in the west coast as well as in the east coast uh, but the problem with them was that you know there was a lot of uh, capacity available but they were underutilized the infrastructure resources continued remained underutilized for a long time the gap areas were larger why they had a large amount of infrastructure capacity their capabilities were limited they were still growing they were not uh, it was kind of a double edged sword or a chicken and egg problem they needed demand uh, to be able to you know fine tune and hone their skills in ship building but there was no demand so therefore uh, that chicken and egg problem and ensure that you know they could really never really build up long term capability of course they were straddled with a large with heavy uh, debts and financial weakness and also that was also coupled to the fact that the productivity and efficiencies as uh, as an industry remained limited compared to international standards and which were further constrained by supply chain limitations so if you look at the problem from the uh, from the demand side while from the supply side the government has continued to do a lot of things like you know offering infrastructure status uh you uh, are permitting subsidies extending the subsidies beyond the original sunset period etc very little has been done in the demand side in terms of generating demand while navy has been continuously been able to generate demand but that is one side of the picture the other side of the picture is kind of remained unfulfilled which is what we try to analyze as to why there was no demand that could be created in the commercial side so if you look at the ancillary industry this is what i was talking about 65% of value addition in shipbuilding comes from shipbuilding ancillary industries and shipyards only you know by value addition is only about 35 to 40% at best and if you look at the shipbuilding ancillary industry and if you try to categorize them into the float move and flight element uh, 90% indigenization has already been achieved in most of the hull material and systems in india uh, and in the move element in terms of the engineering and electrical systems related to power uh, propulsion power generation auxiliary systems control systems damage control systems etc we we have achieved about 60 to 65% indigenization whereas if you look at the fight element we are still largely dependent on you know foreign uh, uh, equipment suppliers and system suppliers and designers and we have only been able to achieve about 40 to 45% indigenization and uh, this uh, sorry this uh, this guy, while the entire gamut is a uh, float move and fight is uh, relevant for naval ship building Uh, the float and move element are extremely relevant for commercial ship building and if you look at it in that uh, context you will uh, realize that you know there is still a large amount of scope of indigenization where further fillip can be given to several key elements in the ancillary industry so now when we looked at it okay so like i said there is uh, there is trend the ancillary industry is slowly moving towards greater indigenization so any time you create a demand on the ship building industry it will have a consequent demand on the ancillary industry and it will have a multiplier effect on the ancillary industry so what is the issue with creating demand how do we create demand so we looked at it uh, purely from a policy point of view and a market uh, perspective point of view as to how will we uh, understand how that uh, uh, how do we understand the idea of uh, demand creation to kind of give a boost to this industry there are several reasons to it if you look at it fundamentally uh, if you compare rail road and waterway cargo if you in transiting waterway cargo has been proven to be one of the most efficient forms whether in terms of speed per unit power the cost efficiency the energy efficiency the fuel efficiency whichever way you look at it water transport uh, has a significant advantage so therefore as a nation as a nation which is picking up its own indigenous production in all other sectors which is looking at continuous transit of men and material particularly for input material for production and produced goods across uh, different hubs etc using waterways will be an extremely efficient way if you are looking at overall trade and overall uh, manufacturing and industry but for some reason that has not exactly happened uh, we have not really fully embraced and uh, leveraged the full potential there are reasons for it so while it is very efficient in, in, in longer times the uh, the first mile and the last mile connectivity issues are still issues which need to be addressed 
Sagarmala program to a large extent is trying to address uh, all aspects of it. But this is, uh, if you really embrace this waterways and, uh, uh, you know, kind of leverage the great advantages that it possesses, automatically there is a lot of scope for demand creation. So if you look at the modal split in transport, uh, you will be surprised that, you know, compared to the rest of the nations, India is hardly carrying anything. About only 8% of the cargo is uh, carried by waterways. Whereas, uh, and we are heavily dependent still on roads. Whereas the world uh, over the modal splits have been significantly different. So, uh, the Sagarmala program is trying to target about 12% share of waterways as motor transport by 2025. But uh, for meeting this demand, we have we have to look at a way in uh, uh, make, look at it as an opportunity available for developing indigenous uh, shipbuilding. Then, if you look at it, okay, so this is the plan we are trying to look at 12%. Where do we stand? If you look at the current uh, fleet. If you look at the overseas fleet, uh, about 50, more than 50% of it is, um, more than 50% of Indian overseas commission may require replacement in the next 10 years because it's more than 20 years old. Some of them are nearly 30 years old. So if you make a policy decision, if you consciously look at it and say, okay, these many need replacement and whatever replacement I need to do, I will do it by indigenous shipbuilding, then you automatically will be able to create a demand. Similarly, if you look at the coastal and domestic fleet, more than 50% is uh, about 20 years old. So, in such a scenario, again, if you look at you know replacement alone, you will be able to generate a sufficient amount of demand uh, for uh, for meeting the requirements of the domestic cargo fleet and eventually achieving what the Sagarmala program intends, which is to significantly pump up the uh, cargo transit through the waterways. Uh, but where do we stand? If you look at it, and uh, uh, you know. This is not something that I am discovering now, but this is something that a lot of our forefathers envisaged more than 100 years ago. If you look at our share in terms of uh, Indian vessels, forget about Indian built vessels, just Indian flag, Indian owned vessels, and Indian overseas cargo, it is less than 8%, which is not a very good picture. If you look at every other country in the world which has developed in terms of global trade, they have had a significant control over their own uh, means of transporting the cargo, and particularly the critical cargo that they require. Whereas we are still in a situation where we are only about eight percent of the, uh, of the our our own cargo. Only eight percent of it is carried by our our own ships. And uh, if you look at you know if you even if you target say fifteen percent in the next uh, decade or so, you can consciously it is possible to imagine a situation where okay I will make this fifteen percent in the next ten years or so in in line with the growing demand for cargo transit in India. And if you can make a conscious effort to say that, okay, that additional fleet requirements for meeting this, if I do it with engineering shipbuilding, I'll be able to create a significant amount of demand. So we looked at all of this and we just crunched some numbers and we came to, you know, absolute baseline estimates also, if you make, there is a 65 million compensated gross tonnage commercial shipbuilding demand that can be created potential simply by looking at replacements and increasing India's share of Indian-owned, Indian-built ships in its own cargo, which is about uh, about 4 billion market and this is just the baseline I'm talking about. If you look at higher numbers in terms of our own capacities, you can look at much higher revenue numbers also. This is in addition to the 40 billion US dollar potential naval shipbuilding demand that's been created already, that is in the pipeline already. So that, And if you look at in terms of employment generation, this can potentially, just this approach can potentially generate about 7 to 8 million jobs. Uh, so, but where do we stand? So then we did a some what we call a Porter's five forces typical strategic analysis uh, for the shipbuilding industry as a whole. So, if you look at it currently, because of its over dependence on the naval shipbuilding, uh, the there is a lot of bargaining power with the navy. There is a medium to high power because it's a monopsonistic market. It's the exact opposite of a monopoly. There is just one buyer, and all the shipyards are unfortunately dependent on that one buyer. So. Uh, so he has a lot of power, but despite enjoying that power, his power is offset because there are only a few shipyards and there is only over in the overall industrial capacity. So if the Navy wants to meet its certain uh, maritime capability perspective program plans, the number of fleets, number of ships coming into the fleet, etc., they are still dependent only on a few shipyards. So his bargaining power is kind of offset. If you look at the bargaining power of the seller, there is only a low to medium power because there is only a single buyer. The requirements that he specifies are rigorous military standard equipment that he wants. They have, and as such, defense shipbuilding is a high cap working capital cost kind of a business. And the only bargaining power that he has is on, on account of the number of uh, limited shipyards who are surviving because many of the private shipyards who try to enter, unfortunately, went into 
NCLT and liquidation because of their inability to survive. Uh, so the bargaining power is somewhat limited. And if you look at threat of entry of new shipyards, the threat is not very high because there are very high initial co costs. The technological complexity is also a very big entry barrier. And if you look at threat of substitute products, that threat is also very low, largely because there is no question of the Indian Navy returning to a scenario where it is going to go back to imports. That's not a scenario that they will ever embrace. We have taken a very right decision in saying that all our naval ships will be built in India. And unduly extending the life of old ships in lieu of new acquisition is also not a preferred option. Way of meeting the demand that is going to be generated by the naval industry, uh, naval shipbuilding industry. So therefore, and if you look at the inter-shipyard competition, the competition is very high. There is one customer largely, few, are, few shipyards are buying, uh, buying for that single buyer. The competition is further skewed by the financial strength of certain PSU and DPSU shipyards. And in many critical projects, there is a need to follow a nomination because uh, while many of you may disagree, the Navy's need to control that shipbuilding is extremely essential. And therefore, there is a need to follow a nomination. And therefore, it will keep going back to certain shipyards which have the capability because the Navy cannot afford to you know, uh, take too many risks in trying to distribute very, very critical projects. So, in this scenario, there is a very clear monopsony. There is a, there is only largely one buyer because the commercial shipbuilding demand is practically non-existent. So, how how do you react and how do you try to leverage this defense shipbuilding scenario to try and see, uh, to build your overall capability to try and take on a bigger load in terms of the commercial shipbuilding? What we did was we looked at how other countries have dealt with this. And strangely so, not strangely so, I would say, most of the countries, this monopsony kind of exists. If you looked at the UK, US, France, Italy, there is a, uh, the defense building tends to be a monopsonic market. And almost as a consequence of the monopsony, the equilibrium has been attained by a, uh, the monopsony on the demand side has been met with a, some sort of a consolidation from the supply side. So in the UK, there were several shipyards which were over a period of time kind of agglomerated into uh, BAE largely for shipbuilding and Babcock as far as ship repair is concerned. They practically enjoy a monopoly in the, with the UK Navy, which is very similar in US. There are only one or two shipyards uh, which, uh, amongst whom the road is largely distributed. There is no proliferation of the number of shipyards. They've all got consolidated under only one or two entities. The same is the case with France where practically uh, Naval Group ent uh, enjoys a monopoly in French defense shipbuilding. And, uh, strangely, so it is almost like a DPSU because 62% of the, uh, the company, the stake is held by the French government. And it is similar in uh, Italy also, where Fincantry enjoys a practical monopoly in the Italian defensive building and 71% uh, share is indirectly held by the company only, by the government only. If this is the case in the Western nations, if you look at what is happening in the East, East is also kind of understood that, you know, shipbuilding as an industry is an extremely a strategic industry. So there is no point in proliferating internal competition. If you are able to agglomerate, if you are able to consolidate your production resources in some form, you will be able to not only meet your domestic requirements better, but you will also be able to become more competitive internationally. And realizing what is happening, uh, Japan Recently, uh, Imabari and JNU, two huge shipyards merged in March 2020, and the government is now mulling consolidation of about 15 shipyards, something which was never thought of before in Japan. In Korea, imagine two absolute rivals in business, Hyundai and Daewoo, they are progressing a possible shipbuilding merger because they want to, they, they want to compete with China, where China itself, two major state-owned entities, China, most of it is largely state-owned, but there were two state-owned entities which have now merged. So if you look at it, if you look at it from the the constant demand generated by a monopsonistic defense shipbuilding, the response to it throughout the world has always been some sort of a consolidation on the supply side. So, is there a lesson to be learned for uh, for India from this? We definitely feel it is it, it is so. So, if you look at it, we th thought of a broad strategic roadmap for the shipbuilding industry, where which not just focuses on the supply side or trying to improve the supply side, but also focuses on the demand side. One of the most important things is to try and get some policy interventions to create local demand uh, for commercial shipbuilding. We uh, gave you some examples, you know, if you bring in a policy saying that a ship more than 25 years old needs to be replaced and the replacement has to happen with an, with an Indian shipbuilding yard, then using measures like that, there is a lot of possibility to create local demand. The second would be to consolidate the resources and strengthen the shipbuilding resources required for both defense and commercial shipbuilding. It's an easy word to use, but it's very complex. There are so many country, companies, there are several DPSUs, there are several private shipyards. So there are different models that are possible to consolidate the resources. Instead of, the overall idea would be to 
you know a certain amount of defense ship building and commercial ship building road you know the total number of resources that is available to you even if you don't have to physically merge the companies if you are able to consolidate the resources instead of making them pick one competition against each other you would rather uh, establish a mechanism where you are able to distribute the load judiciously among them so that all the resources are optimally utilized and uh, we, the supply side the shipyards are also happy and the demand side the navy also gets a large number of its ships in time because My the load is even Doug, under jay kumar if, if in the next 5 minutes if you could kindly consider wrapping up i'm it, done sir is that yes, a, sir i'm done sir yeah thank yes sir. Sir. thank you for your indulgence thank you yes sir yes sir so uh, and uh, so you distribute the load and then uh you, if you if you continue with your existing naval demand naval ship demand and you you also create a demand for commercial ship building uh, using some policy measures then it is possible for you to build up a long term capability across the industry across all players in the industry into the next 5 to 10 years and in the next 5 to 10 years when the global ship building cycle demand picks up again you are sufficiently competitive both in terms of capability and in terms of you know price competitiveness etc to be able to capture a larger share from the um, global market and target once you are able to do that once you have developed the capability then it is possible for you to target the global market and get a bigger uh, share of the global market so this is broadly is the kind of road strategic road map that is possible for the shipbuilding industry and we we published a paper and we gave some broad recommendations both on the demand side and the supply side so Uh, in the demand side like i said this is where i think we must leverage the brilliant mechanisms that the navy has created for defense ship building in india the navy has something called the maritime capability perspective plan it makes long term plans in terms of what are the kind of platforms it requires in the next 15 20 years and uh, it also understands which is the shipyard which is going to be capable of building it and it finds a mechanism to distribute it accordingly so if something similar can be adopted for uh, commercial ship building it is possible to you know judiciously distribute the load and also generate demand in a significant manner complementarily uh, those of course need to be complemented with policy measures like service life of commercial ship etc to avoid pay tangible situations in involving overage fleet etc uh, there must also be some policy measures to incentivize cargo movement on indian owned indian built ships and mandating construction of such ships at indian shipyards these policies are vital for in increasing india's share in its own sea trade that's why i said Vavu uh, Chidambaram Pilla in 1906 said that the country will grow only if it is able to carry most of its cargo by itself, and it's not dependent on a foreign power for it. And if you look at it, that's some that's a vision that was 120 years old, but it is still true. So that is something that, as a policy, that we must look at increasing our our share in our own trade. And if you look at the operations and supply side, uh, one of the recommendations we said was that you must you should try to look at uh, strengthening India's maritime infrastructure, which means. not just ship building but ship shipping assets including ships cargo ships should be viewed as part of india's maritime infrastructure uh, while port development happens on one side there must be an equal thrust on developing india's own india's own fleet and we have to set up a national level authority to holistically strengthen the maritime infrastructure with active participation of ministry of defense because the model that ministry of defense has created for naval ship building that can be an excellent replica to recreate it. uh the ministry of ship in the commercial ship building side uh you must that authority could be empowered to evolve business models for strategies for consolidating resources judiciously distributing the both the defense and the commercial ship building load and facilitating long term capability build up uh the as a as an empowered body it can facilitate ease of funding uh, working capital for the industry it can develop an ecosystem for ship building and by adapting the and replicating the ecosystem that is already created for a defense because you have a reasonably good supply chain you have a reasonably good of quality assurance procedures a reasonably good amount of you know design capabilities that have been built up for defense ship building so that can be easily leveraged here and of course you need to cooperate coordinate with the ministry of skill development to ensure the medium and long term skill development initiatives to widen the base of specific skilled manpower both white collar and blue collar and uh, one important thing would be like the liberty class of uh, ships in uh, uh, liberty class of ships in the us if you are able to generate uh, standard product line common designs and related build strategy then you can think of an assembly like production of uh, uh, commercial ships using modular multi construction techniques to improve production efficiency and of course once you are able to consolidate this industry and increase its output it will be possible as an empowered body it should take it out upon itself to uh, attract and promote investment for the ship building industry and indian ship owned companies through international trials which can also be used to bring in good amount of technology and uh, largely uh, the authority should be empowered to kind of take on uh, the responsibility of evolving long term strategy for 
uh, increasing the global share of the Indian shipping industry. With that, I conclude. Uh, if there is any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Uh, thank you so much, Commander Jay Kumar. That was an extremely insightful and impressive presentation, I must say. Um, I think you sort of covered the entire gamut of what has been in the past, what are the current requirements, and you also projected very admirably uh, some of the perspectives which are uh, compelling in terms of our national requirements. I think just two or three strands, if I may just pick on, which struck me as very obvious givens. One was the fact that you know, um, there is this imperative requirement. In fact, it's a sine qua non. If we need to scale up uh, from our eight abysmal eight percent share of uh, you know carriage in our Indian bottoms on the commercial side, uh, and if you want to sort of raise the bar and reach up to about fifteen percent, we also end up saving to a very large degree the approximate sixty billion dollars of freight payout, which is an annual outgo from our exchequer. And even if a, if a fraction or a significant proportion of that can be plowed back to shipbuilding activities for its promotion, I think that would make significant sense. The second element which struck me as very obvious was the fact that, and of course this is again a given, is that you need scale, the power of scale really, if you want to bring in for a very capital intensive industry such as this, the economies of scale, the efficiencies, the cost effectiveness, the qualitative standards that need to be brought to bear. Um, and of course, the fact that if we are to grow as a maritime power, it is absolutely imperative that we recognize the criticality of shipbuilding. In fact, I would even sort of transcend and say that we have been somewhat remiss from a national policy perspective, and I would uh, seek indulgence of, I mean, to a large extent. We have not sort of, uh, sort of pitched folk and had a broad spectrum vision of where we want the maritime domain to fit in, in terms of our overall national scheme of things. But that said, I think, while well, I thank you so much for your presentation. While I seek to wrap up, I just want to bring to bear what I thought from my sort of understanding, uh, some seven or eight strands of technological developments, which are sort of knocking the doors of the shipbuilding industry. I do believe that uh, some of these would have been subsumed in our own uh, shipbuilding capabilities and more so on the naval side. What is the adoption? And why I say this is given the fact that technology, science, R&D are going to underpin any endeavor that you want to aspire to become a global shipbuilding power. In fact, we are an abysmal, our, our proportion is just about an abysmal 0.7% of the overall global uh, shipbuilding capacity, which India commands for now. One of the features is the 3D printing technology, which I believe is now knocking at our doors and you know where you, it's, it is possible to construct real objects from virtual 3D objects. I believe the N NSWC uh, Cape Rock has fabricated a model of a UNSC, USNS Comfort, which is actually a hospital ship where a 3D printer technology has been leveraged. Um, this is also possible to leverage this technology to replace parts of ships for various repairs. It is generally recognized that you know, this could well usher the third industrial revolution if we were to look at some of these elements. The other aspect which is sort of uh, looming large is the adoption of shipbuilding robotics. I mean, I'm uh, sort of uh, mindful that I do not have the time to do so, but you know, uh, shipbuilding yards, some of the power also such as Hyundai Heavy Industries have developed mine welding robots, which are you know to be used in the realm of robotics. Then the third element is the ballast free ship design, um, which can be leveraged to ease ballast water disposal from ships, and it can prevent the discharge of non-native species and organisms into the surrounding waters. Then you have the LNG fueled engines, which are now coming into play, um, which then can sort of power ships uh, in terms of ship designing. I believe uh, companies such as Mitsubishi, Watsila, uh, Rolls Royce, and MAN Diesel and Turbo are already looking at some of these technologies very, very closely. Then there is this Dean Shipping has developed recently a 6,100. Uh, 
DWT dual fuel chemical tanker known as MTS Argonon. This is the world's first new build LNG fuel tanker. Uh, LNG powered escort tug has also been developed by BNB with LNG engine supports provided by Rolls Royce Marine. Why I'm saying is that a time has come for us to sort of look at all of these extremely closely. Then you have the fifth element of a solar and wind powered ship. Um, then finally, I mean, then you have something called as the Bucky paper. It's a cutting edge technology product, which, you know, but which is so slim. It is made of CNT carbon nanotubes. Each CNT is recognized as 50,000 50, times thinner than, you know, the normal um, uh, human air that we consume. Now compare this to the traditional steel that is used in shipbuilding. Now, the Bucky paper technology is one tenth of the weight of steel, but is about 500 times stronger and twice as hard as diamond when it is sort of, uh, you know, it's formed as a composite. So you can look at some of these lightweight technologies. And finally, you have the integrated electric uh, propulsion. Here, gas turbines or diesel generators, uh, or both of them generate three phase uh, electro products that can be powered for electro electric motors which can then in turn be propelled off for water jets. So essentially what I wanted to highlight is the fact that you have this new age technologies, which uh, the commercial side of Indian shipping has been sort of somewhat remiss, but I think there have been historical reasons which you have sort of very adeptly dealt with. Um, finally, to sum up, what I wanted to say is that while the future holds significant promise, it is about time that we there is an institutionalized mechanism of collaboration, very active, where, you know, I'm, I'm so, sorry to use the, the cliche of PPP, private-public partnerships. You know, we need to look at this very, very closely. And eventually, then we need to have a roadmap with clarity as to what we intend doing. Do we sort of underpin our maritime prowess on indigenous shipbuilding? Or do we continue to import and be dependent? And given the uh, geopolitical and strategic uh, elements which are now coming into play, I dare say that I think we need to look at uh, our own indigenous uh, uh, resources. Finally, with this, given the fact that I needed to be uh, bang on the clock, I thank once again all the organizers for the invites extended to me as well as Commander Jay Kumar. And I'm I'm thanking him on his behalf, and I thank everyone for your patient hearing. I wonder whether there is any provision for a Q&A. If there is, we'll be glad to field any questions in the next couple of minutes. And I'm, I'm mindful that I'm handing over the baton at exactly 2.45 p.m., where I was supposed to draw down the curtains on this session. Uh, I'm also uh, aware that you know there's so much to discuss. Uh, I think it's probably disservice, given the fact that we have constraints of time. But I think that's for some other day where we could dwell on that. So thank you once again, ladies and gentlemen, for your patient hearing. I hand it back to the organizers. Thank you, sir. Thank you for enlightening us with the valuable lecture given by you. Now I request Dr. Ramesh Rao, a OD of Defense and Strategic Studies, Goslam Military College, to please convey the vote of thanks. Uh, good afternoon. It is my honor to propose a formal word of thanks. I, on the behalf of Central Military Education Society and Kanoji Angle Maritime Business Institute, this opportunity to thank uh, Commander Jay Kumar, former naval constructor and specialist in the ship designing, the excellence that he has shown toward in during his uh, during the issue. Uh, and our heartful thanks to Chairman Deepak Shetty, IRS Retired Former Secretary, Government of India, DG Shipping. In Sabi Logone, Hamare student ke liye bohot hi naya ek subject study karne ke liye, samajne ke liye uh, discuss kiya hai. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you all. Uh, with this, I declare to end of the session four we look forward welcome in session next session thank you all thank you so much
Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Concluding with session number four, we'll move forward to session number five. I request Assistant Professor.